Okay, well, it's uh, wonderful to be here. I'm grateful for the hospitality of all of you. It was, uh, as always, uh, a memorable visit. So the lecture that I would like uh, to uh, uh, focus on today is, uh, as the title indicates, is about the journey of humanity. So it's an attempt to understand the journey of humankind since the emergence of Homo sapiens nearly 300,000 years ago in East Africa until the present day. Uh, as Father suggested, this is in fact uh, uh, a popular science book that uh, I will release in about uh, six months. And uh, in fact, it would be accessible in 28 different languages, so you can choose the, the language of your choice. So, the journey of humanity is raising two fundamental mysteries. The first one I would like to define as the mystery of growth, namely what are the roots of this dramatic transformation in living standards in the past two centuries after hundreds of thousands of years of stagnation. And the second mystery is the mystery of inequality, namely what is the origin of this vast inequality in living standards across the globe. Over most of human existence, human life was nasty, brutish, and short, as suggested by Hobbes in the 17th century. It was remarkably similar to that of any other species. In fact, living standards were very close to subsistence, Humans were preoccupied with survival and reproduction, and there were minor differences in living standards across the globe. In fact, a few centuries ago, one fourth of newborn died before reaching the first birthday. Numerous women perished during childbirth. Life expectancy rarely exceeded 40. Most people were illiterate. People did not depart from the remote birthplace in which they were born. And households live in darkness at the moment that the sun disappeared over the horizon. And perhaps most strikingly, an economic crisis during this period did not lead into belt tightening, it led into mass starvation and extinction. Now, if you think about the quality of life, say, of an English farm in the 16th century, it was in fact remarkably similar to the quality of life of, say, a Chinese serf in the 14th century, or a Mayan peasant in the 5th century, or a Greek herder in the 4th century BC, or if you wish, an Egyptian farmer 5,000 years ago, and even a herd in Jericho, the first city on, on, on planet Earth, 11,000 years ago. But remarkably, over the past two centuries, we see this dramatic transformation in living standards, both within societies and across societies. Income per capita in the world as a whole is increasing by a factor of 14. Life expectancy is more than double. And as I said before, there is a great divergence in income per capita across countries and regions of the world. Now, to illustrate it, consider a resident of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus in the first century uh, uh, C, so nearly 2,000 years ago. And with this individual in the time machine into the late 18th century, the beginning 19th century, Ottoman Jerusalem. So this would be a jump in time of about 2,000 years. Despite this 2,000 year jump, these individuals will be able to instantaneously adapt and adapt to the new environment. In fact, past knowledge that existed in Roman Jerusalem in the first century would be largely applicable. Technological improvements would be merely incremental and individuals would be able to adjust to them instantaneously. And occupations 
would require very similar skills. And perhaps most importantly, life expectancy would remain low and unchanged, implying that individuals will not need to reorient themselves to a life that requires planning for the future. But now take this residence of Ottoman Jerusalem and whisk them forward only 200 years forward, okay, from Jerusalem of the 19th century for Jerusalem of today. This will be a devastating experience, a shocking experience. Past knowledge would be largely obsolete. Modern technologies would appear as a witchcraft. Think about the iPhone. Occupations would require incomprehensible skills, and life expectancy would double and would require a completely different mindset and planning horizon that existed before. So again, this transition that occurred in the past 200 years is not incremental. It is really a structural break, a real transformation in the way that we conduct our life. Now, so if you think about living standards, many observers view the improvement in living standards as in the course of human history as a gradual process. Gradual improvement that naturally accelerated over time. But in fact, living standards have not increased gradually in the course of human history. What increased gradually in the course of human history is technological progress. Technological progress accelerated over time, but importantly, it had a negligible impact on living standards over most of human history. And the rise in living standards represent what I will define as a phase transition, namely an abrupt transformation once the tipping point has been reached. But as I said, it is not a process of gradual acceleration. Now, if we want to really visualize this metamorphosis, just look at income per capita in the past 2,000 years. This is hardly appearing as a picture that you would expect to uh, reflect economic activities. It appears more like tectonic activities. Something is erupting around, around 1800. We see a process of a very long stagnation over 300,000 year period and then an enormous eruption that is occurring around the Industrial Revolution. And as I will argue, the Industrial Revolution has no impact on it at all. It is really the rate of technological progress that is accelerating and is basically generating this incredible eruption in income per capita. Income per capita in the world as a whole is increasing by a factor of 14, but income per capita of the richest countries in the world increased by a factor of about 40. And at the same time, this eruption is associated with an additional phenomenon, great divergence that occurred in the past 200 years. Some countries are taking off early, Western Europe and the offshoots in North America and Oceania. Others are lagging behind, and as a result, of it, there is an incredible divergence that is occurring across the globe. Unlike the neoclassical model that is suggesting to us that we should see convergence over time, what we see is that economies are behaving more like galaxies that are departing from one another rather than economies in the solar model. So as I said, when you look at the data, there are two fundamental mysteries that, that are emerging. First, the mystery of growth, and again, what is the underlying causes of this economic ice age, literally economic ice age, and what ultimately triggered this metamorphosis in the past two centuries? And in the context of the mystery of inequality, again, we would like to understand the roots of this vast inequality in living standard across the globe, but at the same time, we would like to understand what accounts for the divergence in income per capita in the past two centuries. And what are the factors that inhibited the convergence of poorer economies into richer ones? And if possible, what is the role of deep-rooted factors, factors that were determined in the distant past, historical forces, prehistorical forces, forces that perhaps were formed 
Litvin, tens of thousands of years ago, in understanding inequality as exists today. Now, if you think about the process of development as a whole, one can segment the process of development into three fundamental phases. The Matusian epoch, the post matusian regime, and the modern growth regime. Now, the Matusian epoch emerges at the time where human appears in East Africa 300,000 years ago. And it lasts over 99.9% .9 of human existence, namely till the eve of industrialization in the context of the most developed countries in the world. Now, during this Malthusian epoch, economies are in a state of what I will define as Malthusian stagnation. The sense that income per capita is fluctuating run largely without any trend. But there is some technological progress and some growth of population, and this will be instrumental in understanding ultimately the transition to the next So over 300,000 years, we have certain forces that are percolating below the surface that are ultimately generating the initial takeoff. I think during this initial takeoff, it is still the case that Malthusian forces are operating, and as a result of it, we see technological progress progressing very rapidly, and we see the counterbalancing effect of population, but biological reproduction lags behind technological progress, and consequently, we start to see the emergence of economic growth. But ultimately, it is the demographic transition towards the end of the 19th century, nearly 150 years ago, among the, the uh, most advanced uh, uh, countries in the world, that is basically permitting the world to move into the modern growth regime in which the growth in income per capita is relatively stable. So again, if we think about the Matusian epoch, what we would really now to understand is first what account for this epoch of stagnation. I like defined it an economic ice age that characterizes 99.9% .9 of human existence. And what are the forces that ultimately permitted us to escape from what I will define as the arms of the Malthusian octopus? How can we escape a stable equilibrium? I mean, this is a stable equilibrium that, that, that prevailed over 300,000 years. How do we escape from, from a stable equilibrium? How do we escape from a black hole? So the critical aspect of the Malthusian, the Malthusian epoch that allows us to understand these subtleties is the dualism that is associated with the Malthusian epoch. On the one hand, we have stagnation, but on the other hand, we have certain dynamism, part of it beneath the surface. But if you think about stagnation, stagnation is in the context of living standards. Living standards are fluctuating near the subsistence level, largely without any trend. From time to time we see trend, but it's really negligible in the context of uh, the broad perspective of, uh, of human history. Life expectancy is fluctuating in a narrow range of 25 to 40. But as I said, there is a great dynamism that occurs over this time period. Technology is advancing very, very slowly. <clears throat> One stone tool is replacing another stone tool, and this may occur thousands of years, but it occurs. In over 300,000 year period, it does make a huge difference because there is certain interaction between population and technology that permitting population to grow over time and to feed back into the growth of technology. But if you think about the growth of population during this epoch of stagnation, the growth of population is not comprehensible in the sense that the population of the world from since the emergence of Homo sapiens till the, till the present is a factor of about 10,000 fold or 100,000 fold depending on your estimate of the initial population. But even if you think about the population in the eve of the agricultural revolution and the population at, uh, at the time of uh, the industrial revolution, again, this is an increase that is much larger than 1,000 folds. So this is the dynamism that is operating beneath the surface, if you wish. But there is an additional component.
component that is very important. During this time period, human attributes, cultural and otherwise, are adapting to the economic environment, to the technological environment, to the geographical environment. And this adaptation, along with technological progress and population growth, are critical to the trigger of the transition from stagnation to growth. Okay? Now, so let's think about it a little more carefully because these are instrumental building blocks. But as I said, when you think about the Malthusian network, this is a time period in which technological progress results in an increase in income per capita in the short term. You have a better plow, better seeds, and as a result of it, in the end of the year, you can have a larger crop than otherwise. This crop is converted ultimately into larger amount of people. Why is it so? Because naturally it permits a reduction in fertility, it permits an increase, a reduction in mortality, it permits an increase in fertility, and consequently, over time, income per capita reverts back to the previous equilibrium position. So during the Malthusian epoch, technologically advanced societies or land-rich societies are having higher population density but largely very similar levels of income per capita. And we see it in the dynamics of, of, of population within a country over time, and we see it in cross-country analysis. For instance, if you regress population density in the year 1500 on land productivity in, uh, that, that is prevalent at the time, then you can see this positive relationship between land productivity and population density. But this by itself, of course, is not a confirmation of the Malthusian hypothesis. Of course, population density will be larger in the fertile regions of Europe than in the Sahara Desert. The striking element is that income per capita in the Sahara Desert and the fertile land in, in, in Europe are the same. Namely, there is no impact of land productivity to a large extent on income per capita. And the same is true for technology. When you have a more advanced technology, it is converted into more people, but not into richer people. That's really a very striking uh, insight about the way that the Malthusian world is operating. But as I said, it is not only that technology affects the level of population, it affects the adaptation of the population in a very particular way. The Malthusian pressure, as we said, increases the size of the population when technology advances. But at the same time, it generates an adaptation of the population. In what way? Well, if there are certain intergenerationally transmission traits, whether they are cultural or otherwise, that are complementary to the growth process, then they will generate higher income, by definition of being complementary to the growth process. But remember, in the Malthusian world, higher income implies higher reproductive success. And as a result of it, these traits that are transmitted intergenerationally will become more prevalent over time. And that's really instrumental and very insightful about the way that the growth process operates. These evolutionary processes, that can be, if you wish, predominantly cultural, raise the prevalence of complementary traits to the growth process, reinforce the growth process, and ultimately stimulate the transition from stagnation to growth. But this epoch of stagnation that lasted over a 300,000 year period was instrumental in the changes in the composition of the population and making the population more complementary to the growth process and ultimately triggering the takeoff from stagnation to growth. So, an additional element is how, in fact, these changes in the size and the composition of the population are feeding into technology. So during this time period, the size and the composition of the population foster technological progress. Why? Because it affects the supply of innovations, the number of potential innovators. It affects the demand for innovations, the number of customers for these innovations, the diffusion of this knowledge, the division of labor, and reverse engineering that is associated with it. 
the extent of trade, and again, the uh, impact of, of, on technological progress. So you can see the different links that are operating during this time period. And during this Malthusian epoch, the population size and the population composition affects technology. And on the other hand, technology affects population size and the population composition. And this is basically a reinforcing cycle that is operating over the course of human history. These are the wheels of change. They're operating very, very slowly initially, but ultimately they gain pace over the course of human history. And as technological process accelerates, ultimately, the pace of biological reproduction cannot keep, pay, cannot keep up with technological progress. It takes nine months to, to raise a child. And consequently, we start to see the growth in income per capita. Technology is advancing more rapidly than populations. We start to see the growth of income per capita, along with an incredible spike in population. Because still, people are richer, they can afford to live better, and at the same time, to raise very large families. This is what we see over this time period, incredible increase in income per capita in population. And this rotation of the wheels of change intensify in the course of human history. Population size and composition reinforces technological progress. Technological progress supports more people and more adaptable people. And ultimately, this process reaches a critical pressure, a bifurcation point if you want to use the mathematical concept. Suddenly, human capital is needed in order to allow individuals to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment. And consequently, human capital that is being formed triggers a behavior change, a reduction in fertility. Now, parents, in fact, prefer smaller families but more educated children. And here, the bifurcation point is causing the Malthusian equilibrium simply to vanish. It was a stable equilibrium, but as you know from bifurcation theory, a stable equilibrium can vanish, and the Malthusian equilibrium simply vanishes. And the world is free from the counterbalancing effect of population, and the world is gravitating into the modern growth regime. And if you wish, the holy triangle, technological progress, human capital formation, and the decline in population growth are all supporting sustained economics. So these are the wheels of change that you should consider. Population composition, population size, and technological progress. These are the wheels of change. They are basically feeding each other over the course of human history, initially very slowly, ultimately the process accelerates, generating growing imp importance for human capital. As parents start to invest in human capital, they have to economize on the size of their families, we see the fertility transition. This is the phase transition, the demographic transition is coming into place, and the world is gravitating into the modern growth regime. And metaphorically, this is in fact the transition that we see. You think about the transition from water to gas. Naturally, as the temperature rises, gradually, ultimately, it reaches the tipping point in which water are converted into gas. In a very similar fashion, over the course of human history, technological progress and its gradual impact on the return to human capital is causing a phase transition, a movement from the Malthusian epoch into the modern growth regime. And when I'm referring to the sustained growth regime, you can see here quite clearly that in the past 150 years, the growth of the most advanced societies uh, on the planet is relatively stable at around 1.8 to 2% per year over this 150-year period. But naturally, the demographic transition and the forces behind the demographic transition is not occurring at the same time period across the globe. Some regions of the world are experiencing the demographic transition as early as 150 years ago, others only very recently. And as a result of it, we start to see these great divergence that occur across the globe. And this should clarify 
lives. That if we want to understand the roots of inequality across the globe today, and if we want to resolve the roots of inequality today, it is a terrible mistake to focus on the contemporary period, because in fact, this is the singular point in which people are, societies are starting to, to separate themselves. So we need to look at historical forces, virus in the process of technological progress, virus in the process of human capital formation that are basically separating societies and causing these great divergences. So as I said, when we think about uneven development, there was a tendency initially to focus on what we call the proximate causes of development, namely cross-country differences in physical capital accumulation, human capital accumulation, and technological level. Listen carefully to what I said. This is clearly searching for the coin under the wrong place. The coin did not fall there. This is a different location entirely. We want to understand cross-country differences in income per capita today, we need to search much deeper than that. Actually, we have to ask ourselves why in fact human capital differ? Why technological progress differ across society? Why some society fail to efficiently invest in physical and human capital uh, formation? And why some society fail to adopt advanced technologies? The arbitrage opportunities are huge. There must be some forces that are forcing society, in some sense, to, uh, to uh, adopt certain things much slower. And this led into a large research agenda that is basically occupying most of uh, what uh, uh, has uh, are engaging in the context of growth and society development, namely an attempt to understand the roots of this historical and prehistorical. And when we think about deep roots, we can think about cultural and institutional forces, and we can think about the ultimate forces, namely geographical forces and societal characteristics. And societal characteristics, from my viewpoint, is the role of human diversity. So let's first talk about what I would call the fingerprints of institutions. Well. Certainly, we see that across the globe, different societies have different types of institutions. In some, we see the emergence of growth-enhancing inclusive institutions. In others, we see the emergence of, take the risk, of growth-retarding extractive institutions. Okay? But Naturally, institutions are not man from heaven. Why some societies are adopting one type of institutions rather than others? So, it is the case that sometimes in the course of human history, as some define critical junctures, we see the emergence of institutions in a relatively random fashion. So think about Korea, perhaps this is the best example. The division of Korea along the 38th parallel is generating a division across a geographical territory that is very similar, is generating a division across society that is very similar. And as a result of this random division into two forms of institutions, inclusive institutions and extractive institutions, we see this divergence between the Koreas, where North Korea's income per capita is 24 times larger than South Korea. But this is convincing. It's convincing that, in fact, there could be critical junctures in human history in which the division is based on some random events. Note, by the way, that here it's really a very interesting case in which it's not political institutions that are making the difference initially. It is economic institutions, because North, South Korea is a dictatorship till 87. Okay, only in 87 it becomes a democracy. So it's really initially it's economic institutions and ultimately it's both economic and political institutions. There are other important examples. For instance, the impact of the Black Death on the decline in feudalism in, in the UK and the importance of the decline in feudalism in the emergence of property rights and ultimately the industrialization in India. In. So again, the Black Death 
is to a large extent an exogenous kind of event that is leading into the emergence of certain types of institutions in some societies. Another classical example is the glorious revolution, right? And so we can certainly think about an alternative scenario in which William, uh, William of Orange would not have uh, able to depose uh, Henry VII. In which case, perhaps institutions would not have been formed in the way that they were formed. But literally, these are the examples that I can come with. Okay, so I listed what I can come with comfortably. But as I said, these are the rare events in the course of human history. Institutions mostly evolve gradually in the course of human history. And how do they evolve? Well, if you think about the agricultural revolution, the agricultural revolution generated a certain surplus. This surplus generated large population density. And at a certain point, we needed certain devices to coordinate the behavior of individuals, namely rule of law. And consequently, institutions were formed. So institutions were a reaction to economic activities that were conducted there. Think about alternative elements. Soil suitability for large plantations has existed in Mesoamerica. Naturally, soil suitability for large plantations generated um, um, some sort of demand for certain type of labor and ultimately led into the emergence of coercive institutions, slavery, and extraction. Again, these institutions did not emerge out of the blue. They emerged in particular geographical locations where geography suggested that this should occur. And think about the disease environment. Africa comes, uh, comes to mind in this respect. And uh, if you wish, it sets a fly, its impact on, on labor productivity and, uh, and the ability to adopt animals. So the disease environment naturally reduced population density quite dramatically. And as a result of it, it delayed the adoption of centralized institutions. And actually, I could have had an hour talk about examples of this sort. Okay, so there are three examples of random elements and three examples of non random elements, but the number, number of non random elements uh, can span uh, the entire lecture. Well, the point that I'm raising is that yes, political institutions are important, but in fact, they are based on deeper thought. Second, let's talk about the cultural factor. Naturally, there are variation in cultural traits across societies. And in the context of the divide between Southern Italy and Northern Italy, some suggested that in fact, growth enhancing traits such as social capital were present in the North. Growth retarding traits such as family ties were present in the South. And this brought about the divide in a society that otherwise is residing under the same umbrella in terms of institutions. But again, cultural traits are not enough. Again, like in institutions, we can find instances in which we see random growth enhancing cultural mutations that are occur. And perhaps the best example is in Judaism, where in the first, first century BCE, Jewish sages are imposing the norm of educating sons to be able to recite the Bible in front of the community. In some sense, they are imposing mandatory literacy. Now, at the time, there was no justification for this beyond the fact that this is simply designed to cater for religious norms. But ultimately, as societies evolved, this norm became very handy in the sense that it gave the Jewish people comparative advantage in human capital intensive occupation in the modern world. And this is certainly a random mutation. The sages could have decided that perhaps uh, people should walk with uh, their hands tied in the back, and uh, we would see something different uh, in Judaism. Now, the same is true in the context of Protestantism. Emphasis on thrift and entrepreneurship naturally led into uh, what Weber defined as the uh, 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 
is the uh, student culture. But again, culture largely evolved and adapted to the environment. And there are plenty of examples here. And I will cite some, some of them. Think about the Neolithic Revolution. The Neolithic Revolution is emerging. People are engaged in trade and exchange. And as a result of it, the return broadly to human capital is increasing quite dramatically. You have the cognitive ability to understand the meaning of trade, to communicate in, 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 in languages effectively, to understand the motive of others. You have a great advantage. And as a result of it, predisposition toward child quality is emerging over this time period and is increasing in prevalence over time. So again, this is a cultural norm, namely predisposition towards investment in education that is not based on this mandatory rule is imposed by, by two stages, it is a reaction to market return. Alternatively, you can think about crop yield. Higher crop yield naturally is giving you greater incentive to invest in agricultural uh, crops, to plant and to harvest. But there is a delay from planting to harvesting, and therefore if the environment is inducing you to be engaged in this type of a process, it somehow enhances your future-oriented mindset. It, it teaches you how to delay gratification and to see that, in fact, delay gratification is rewarding. Or you can think about climatic vulnerability and how it affects loss aversion and, as a result of it, perhaps reducing entrepreneurial spirit. Or you can think about the suitability of the land for the use of the flat plow and how it affects gender biases in society due to the fact that the plow is relatively heavy to hold and it requires upper body strength that is at a greater supply among men than among women. So again, cultures, cultural factors are very important, but there are underlying forces behind them. So this leads us into what I would define as the shadow of the Namely, geographical characteristics such as soil quality, the disease environment, isolation, etc. It affected directly or indirectly labor productivity, affected human capital formation because naturally, if you live in a place where you are unlikely to survive, there is limited incentive to invest in human capital. And it affected the evolution of cultural and institutional traits, as I just explained to you. So, geographical characteristics are certainly part of the ultimate forces behind the process of development. They affect in, in culture, institutions, and directly productivity. Now, there is another element of geography that I would like to, uh, to spend some time on, which is the onset of the narrative. So, as you know, 1970, in 1997, Jared Diamond publishes an influential book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, in which he argued that, in fact, comparative development across the globe today is based on differential timing of the Neolithic Revolution across the globe. What was his argument? He suggested that the transition from hunter gatherer tribes to agricultural communities led into the emergence of a non-food producing class. A surplus was produced and some people were not needed in the production of, uh, of, uh, of agricultural goods. And this non-food producing class were engaged in knowledge creation in the form of science, technology, written languages, generating a technological head start that persisted to the present. And therefore, the variation in the timing of the Neolithic Revolution, according to Jerry Diamond, is in fact the source of the, 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 the roots of inequality today. Okay. So, absolutely, Diamond is completely right. There are great variations in the timing of the onset of the Neolithic Revolution. The Neolithic Revolution occurs first in the Fertile Crescent, around 12,000 years ago, independently in China, around 10,000 years ago, independently in Mesoamerica, around 9,000 years ago, etc. So there are great variations in the timing of the onset of the Neolithic Revolution, but the question is whether they are mapped 
as suggested by Diamond, into variations in income per capita today for any measure of prosperity today. So, as you can see in this map, the Neolithic Revolution is emerging independently in seven locations. Okay? And one striking element, if you look at the Fertile Crescent, for instance, where basically we see the initial domestication of wheat, barley, goats, etc. The orientation of the, uh, the Euro-Asian landmass, the East-West orientation, is permitting the diffusion of these uh, plants and domesticated animals along with similar latitudes and make them more prevalent over this continent where similar developments in other places are not subjected to the same forces because of the north-south orientation of the America and the relatively north-south orientation of the Africa. In addition, the geographical barriers, as you know, the rainforest in Mesoamerica is pre preventing people from crossing easily into South America, and the Sahara Desert, again, is pre preventing people from diffusing diffusion of agricultural technologies from, uh, from the third and present deeper into South Southern Africa. So according to Diamond, the prosperity of Eurasia is basically based on geographical factors that are conducive to biodiversity, climate, landmass, latitude, etc. It's brought about a larger number of domesticable species of plants and animals, and in addition, suggested this east-west orientation of this particular uh, um, landmass, the Euro-Asia landmass, brought about the diffusion of agricultural practices along similar lines. And according to Diamond, this early analytic revolution led to persistent technological head start and consequently the domination of Europe over the world in the post-colonial period. So we will see momentarily what the data is saying. If you didn't read what I wrote about it before, that's uh, leave it for you as a surprise. And it is sort of very surprising for me, so hopefully it will be surprising for you too. Um, so, so this brings us 12,000 years back in history. But this is where we need to start. No, because in fact, women are not starting their career of planet Earth in the eve of the industrial and the agricultural revolution. They started the career on planet Earth as a whole at the time of the dispersal of an atomically modern human over the planet 60 to 90,000 years ago. So the out of Africa hypothesis of comparative development, I have advanced so over the years together with uh, my co authors suggests that the migration of Homo sapiens out of Africa 60 to 90,000 years ago is in fact a critical force that affected the distribution of human diversity of any type, cultural, phenotypic, linguistic, genetic, and consequently affected comparative development in a very critical fashion. So if Diamond took us back 12,000 years ago, I'm taking you back nearly 100,000 years ago. And as I will show you momentarily, this event that occurred so long ago is critical for the understanding of comparative development today. It explains nearly 20% of the variations in income per capita today, not in the past, today. More than institutions, six times more than institutions. So what are the main building blocks of the proposal about this? First, the serial founder fact, a well-founded uh, theory in evolutionary biology that suggests that one should expect lower diversity among indigenous population at greater migratory distance from Africa. The further you migrate, the greater is the compression, and I will explain why. And the second one is the existence of intermediate level of diversity that is conducive for productivity. This level that balances between the adverse effect of diversity on social cohesiveness, unavoidable, and the beneficial effect of diversity on creativity and innovativeness. 
Don't you know humans are dispersing out of Africa? This is an atomically modern human, 60 to 200,000 years ago. In fact, the earliest remain of Homo sapiens that we see out of Africa exists in the Carmel Mountain in Israel 194,000 years ago, and in, uh, in Greece around 208,000 years ago. But in fact, if you look at the DNA of people in this room or anywhere on planet Earth, there are no traces of DNA in us. Namely, the conventional theory is that during the I the Ice Age, this population either reverted back to Africa, okay, and therefore the DNA that we see today is originated in Africa, or alternatively, they became extinct due to competition with other species, etc., and naturally the harsh uh, climatic condition. What we certainly know, you look at the DNA today of humans across the globe, is that we are all originated from what is known as mitochondrial Eve. Okay, a mother that existed in Africa about 120 to 150,000 years ago. We have all originated from her. Okay, naturally there were many mothers at the time, but their lineages became extinct. And what we know is that there was a second wave of migration, massive one, 60 to 90,000 years ago. Again, this is based on simulation, so one can date it differently. Now, importantly, humans are arriving into Europe about 45,000 years ago. This is the latest day that we have. In Australia, 47 to 65,000 years ago, they occupied Beringia, namely both sides of the Bering Strait, 25,000 years ago. They crossed into Alaska with certainty, based on carbon-14 dating, already 25,000 years ago. They move into North America, 14 to 23,000 years ago. So if I would present this paper uh, two weeks ago, I would say 14 to 17, but there was huge discovery recently of uh, footprints of humans in, in, uh, in the US that uh, basically is dated to 21 to 23,000 years ago. And the earliest dates that we have, the earlier carbon 14 dating for South America is around 14,000 years ago. Now, so as I said, when humans start to depart from Africa, departing populations carried with them only a subset of the genetic makeup, or they carry with them only a subset of the diversity that existed in the original population. And this is diversity that is cultural, phenotypic, genetic, behavioral, linguistic. Don't dwell on the genetic aspect. It's general diversity. Now, migration was sequential. And as a result of it, the further people move from Africa, the less diverse they became. So the population that is existing in Africa is relatively small. The departing population is an order of magnitude smaller. So this is a sampling from a limited distribution that is by construction not representative. And as a result of it, diversity is defined. So if in the original colony, colonies in Africa, we had a certain level of diversity, Think about it as cultural diversity, different type of, of, uh, of uh, cultural traits. And people are basically moving into the Fertile Crescent, certain traits will disappear. And as they move west into Europe, additional traits are disappearing. And as they move gradually into the Americas, ultimately the degree of diversity is declining and declining and declining as a function of migratory distance from Africa. And in fact, if you look at the evidence, the evidence is very striking. The serial founder effect is all over. So if you look, for instance, at the relationship between migratory distance from Africa in 10,000 kilometers, so this is 25,000 kilometers from Africa, what you can see here is that the most diverse population are in Africa. This is based on measure of genetic diversity, followed by the Middle Eastern population, the European population, the Asian population, the Oceanian population, and this is basically the Western Amazon in the Americas. So striking relationship. This is unconditional. 86% of the variations in, income, in, in, in diversity is explained by migratory distance from Africa. Now, if you look at the larger sample that Mark and I uh, and, and Q have been using uh, recently, which is the largest sample that exists on genetic diversity, about 230 
ethnic groups that can be mapped into their homelands, you can see quite clearly that the same pattern is maintained. 84% of the variations is explained by migratory distance from Africa. No controls are involved here. This is the raw correlation. And again, Africans are more diverse and, uh, and Native Americans are the least diverse. But this is not unique to genetic diversity. This is overall diversity. So if you look at uh, phenotypic diversity, dental bone diversity, pelvic bone diversity, etc., you see the same pattern. And if you look at phonemic diversity, you can see here, once again, the serial founder. The greater diversity in languages exists in Africa, and it declines as we move from Africa. But this is very broad, okay? Now, so this is the serial founder. So what it, it suggests to us that during the migration out of Africa, the distribution of human diversity on planet Earth was determined in a very profound way that lasted largely till today, taking fully into account the migration that occurred in the post-1500 period. The second element is the trade-off between human diversity and productivity. So as I said, there exists a diversity level that maximizes productivity, the one that balances between the adverse effect of diversity on cohesiveness and a beneficial effect on creativity and innovations. So let me show you some of the elements. You think about human diversity, it enhances mistrust. Think about higher human diversity, it generates disagreement about the desirable public goods and as a result of intention and conflicts. Human diversity increases ethnic fractionalization, as you heard indirectly in, uh, in Mark's talk uh, uh, two days ago. And consequently, human diversity is generating interpersonal and ethnic conflicts, and consequently, social non cohesiveness and inefficient productivity relative to the production possibility. So you can see it in the context of trust, again, cross countries, the more diverse the society is, the less trustful it is. But if you want to look at it even at the individual level, what we showed in our previous paper is that if you look at second generation migrants in the United States, and this is individual level analysis, the level of trust is related to the level of diversity that existed in their country and the third country. Namely, if you came from a place that is relatively diverse, you're less trustful today, despite the fact that you were born in the United States, you face the same institutions in the United States, the same incentives, etc. But this is the persistent characteristic that you can see in the context of second generation migrants in the US. And the same is true for Africa. Again, if you look at individuals that are residing in different cities in, in Africa, you map them into the ancestral ethnic homeland, then the diversity in the ancestral homeland will predict the level of diversity today, namely the more diverse the ancestral homeland, the less trustful individuals will be. Second, you can see that diversity is associated with greater divergence in political preferences. People have disagreements about investment in education, investment in infrastructure, etc. This is a source of conflict. And, as I said before, you can think about it in the context of ethnic fragmentation. The more diverse the society is, the more fragmented it is. And consequently, diversity is a huge source of social conflict. You can see it here, but this is basically regression of conflicts onset in the time period 1960 to 2017 on population diversity, and you can see a strikingly strong effect of population diversity, interpersonal diversity. It is particularly striking and eye-opening for those of you who work in this literature that, in fact, interpersonal diversity is trumping ethnic fractionalization and ethnic polarization. They are not really significant in explaining conflicts. And in fact, you can decompose the overall population diversity into population diversity within a group and population diversity between groups. And you can see again that the dominating factor is interpersonal diversity within group as opposed to between groups. And this stands 
uh, nicely in IV regressions, uh, 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 quite, uh, quite striking. So this is the relationship between diversity and civil conflict. The more diverse you are, uh, the more conflict will be across countries, and this is across ethnic groups. Again, the greater the diversity, the greater are the conflicts. It's quite striking. The cost of diversity is very visible. But there are benefits of diversity. Okay? And population diversity, as I said, increases cross fertilization of ideas and complementarity in the production process. And therefore, it fosters innovations and expands the production possibility frontier. And you can see, for instance, here in the context of cross country analysis, in which basically more diverse societies, this large number of controls, is affecting the average under scientific uh, scholarship per, uh, per capita. Okay. But it's going much beyond that. I mean, uh, we, have, uh, we have many evidence about uh, sort of complementarity in the classroom across individuals, etc. And uh, again, these are genetically based evidence, culturally based evidence, etc. Now, so what does it mean? It means that if we have um, positive and diminishing effects of diversity of infections, and positive and diminishing effects of homogeneity of social cohesiveness, then there should be a shaped relationship between diversity and development. Namely, there will be an intermediate level of diversity. Diversity is measured in the time in the interval 0, 1, there will be an intermediate level that will increase productivity. This will not be constant over time. Why? Because as we move into the post-1500 period and technology accelerates, the benefits of diversity in terms of innovations increases, and consequently, the optimal level of diversity is shifting rightward. Namely, more diverse society should have the upper end. So this is the theory. And how do we show that this is indeed the case? So naturally, there are a lot of issues here in terms of identification and complexity, and we resolve them in different ways. But initially, one can focus on cross-country analysis in the pre-1500 period, namely looking at 145 countries in the pre-1500 period and looking at predicted diversity, not not uh, actual diversity, we don't have the measures for it, but in addition, we want to capture overall level of diversity. So, we basically look at prehistoric migratory distance from Africa to predict diversity in these populations and conduct analysis. As we move into the modern world, one thing that comes to mind is naturally the diversity uh, that, uh, say, exists in the United States today it is not based on Native Americans in the United States, they're less than 1% of the population. So naturally, we will have to predict diversity based on the proportional representation of each ancestral population in American society today. And then, predict for each group, say the people that originated in England, their diversity based on migratory distance between England and uh, East Africa. And then take into account that when we mix Chinese and, and, and Swedes in America, it's different than mixing Danish and, and Swedes. Namely, take into account the pairwise migratory distances between populations. So once you construct this measure, you have an elaborate measure of diversity for contemporary population that is taking into account the complexity of the world in the past uh, five uh, period. But naturally, some people are always concerned about uh, uh, um, cross-country analysis uh, and, uh, and what we attempt to do is to show that, in fact, this uh, relationship is observed across ethnic groups, these 230 uh, group samples that we have, and uh, um, IV uh, regressions, etc. And you will see it as we move uh, forward, and ultimately for basically all the ethnic groups in the ethnographic areas, 1,265 Okay, so if you look at diversity uh, in the pre-colonial period, 
as you expect, the most diverse societies are in East Africa, the least diverse are in the Americas, and that's basically based on migratory distance from Africa. But if you look at diversity today, North America will be quite diverse because Europeans are migrating into the Americas, some Africans are migrating into the Americas, etc. And therefore, the least diverse population in America will be Bolivia, where basically the fraction of the native population is very, very large, and Native Americans, as you know, as I suggested, are uh, the most homogeneous one on the planet Earth. Okay. So in the pre-1500 period, what we, what we see is uh, basically uh, the following. I suppose that we want to explain productivity in the pre-1500 period. One possibility, as I said, that human diversity affected productivity, and human diversity is basically predicted by migratory distance from Africa. Alternatively, Jerry Diamond will argue it's all about the timing since the Neolithic Revolution. So let's put it in. And the geography or the geography camp would say it's all about geography. We would have uh, you know, so percentage of arable lands, utility of land for agriculture, etc. We would have basically to take all these elements into account. So if you look at this table, I'll just focus on column one for a moment, you can see that if you look at population density in the year 1500, and you look at population diversity and population diversity square, there is a pronounced hamster-shaped relationship between diversity and population density. Namely, productivity in the year 1500 is explained quite nicely by, uh, by, uh, by predicted diversity. And as I said, there can be diversity of any type. Second column, this is the Jared Diamond channel. Okay, you can see very nicely, Jared Diamond is absolutely on the map till 1500, very, very strongly so. The Neolithic Revolution is a very good predictor for productivity till 1500. And if you look at the geography camp, the geography camp is very important too, and precisely as you predict, the highest uh, percentage of arable land, the highest uh, population density. If you look at the world in 1500, uh, then you can see this hump-shaped relationship between, uh, between predicted diversity and, uh, and population density. And you can see that the peak of the hump is associated with countries that you would not necessarily view as optimally diverse. Japan, Korea, China. But remember, in the year 1500, when you want to balance between the effects of diversity on Innovativeness and progressiveness, the name of the game is cohesiveness. China is benefiting from the fact that it's relatively cohesive, and the sort of the, the, the sweet spot, the spot exists in this location. Now, for those of you who are coming from sort of uh, the geography camp or from the, the trade camp, naturally. One can be concerned. I mean, the distances are always sort of uh, uh, potential fear about some confounding geographical uh, uh, geographical factors and distances. So note, if you compute not migratory distance from Africa, if you allow people to use the dreamliner from Africa, there will be no result whatsoever. If you allow people to, if if you allow Homo sapiens to emerge in London, Tokyo, Mexico, there is nothing that will emerge. It's really about migratory distance from Africa. I could have gone here on and on for another 15 minutes. Now, if you don't like data on population density, we may just use the data on urbanization and sensation and upshape relationship between uh, diversity and urbanization. Now, as we move into the modern world, as I said before, again, focus for a moment from 1500. Diversity, diversity square is important. The Neolithic Revolution is important. The geography is important. Look what happened here. Look at column three. First, diversity is very important. Okay. The optimal diversity, as suggested theoretically, is increasing in this process. Okay. So the optimal diversity is shifting towards countries that are more diverse. Diamond disappeared entirely. That's what we see consistently. In fact, 
if there is any, I mean, if we see some relationship within the European continent, it's a negative relationship. So Diamond is a very forceful theory, very innovative theory, but it holds only till the era of globalization, and then it disappears for reasons that you can read in, uh, in my book. And uh, the geography component is very important. Undoubtedly, so it is important, and uh, you will see it momentarily when I quantify the different uh, the different magnitudes here. So now, when you look at the relationship between diversity and productivity, and again, this is, I mean, I don't think about genetic here. It's really overall diversity. It's really not genetic diversity. Okay? So the country that is at the speed spot now is the United States. As we move into an era in which innovations are much more important than before, then the optimal diversity shifts towards uh, countries that are more uh, uh, diverse, and the US is at the sweet spot. So the level of diversity, which is basically the probability the two individuals that are to sample at random will differ from one another, is about 0.72, and that's the US level. Just to calibrate the magnitudes, and the magnitudes are enormous. If you take a country like Bolivia, that is the most homogeneous one in the sample, okay, with a level of diversity of 0.63, and you move the level of diversity of Bolivia to that of the US, income per capita in Bolivia would increase by a factor of 5.4. Unimaginable. Accounting for education, institution, culture, legal origins, anything that was ever mentioned in the comparative development literature, just this element is generating a 5.4 fold increase. And if you look at Ethiopia, the most heterogeneous country in the world, the increase would be more modest, but still incredible 1.7 fold increase in income per capita due to a move into the sweet spot level of diversity. And as I said before, some may be concerned about country fixed effects, so let's look at ethnic groups. If you look at 1,265 ethnic groups across the globe, you can see this sensation of an unshaped relationship in the course of human history, starting with 10,000 BCE to the present. Okay? Nice unshaped relationship, unshakable, you can look at it 1,000 years at a time, and, and with anything possible to it, it's not shakeable. So it's very, very stable. So what do we see here? Remember the winds of change. It's all related. So the institutional and the cultural camp suggests that, in fact, it's all about it. I mean, the institutional camp certainly suggests that it's all about institutions, nothing else. But the more broad viewpoint of the world is that maybe institutions, maybe cultural are important. They are. But the deep factors are the initial conditions, geography and migratory distance from Africa. As I said, geography and migratory distance from Africa explains institution, explain cultural forces, they affect the winds of change, and ultimately they are bringing about a transition from stagnation to growth. If you have favorable geographical conditions, favorable human diversity, then the takeoff from stagnation to growth will occur much earlier than otherwise, and you will be the dominating force in the world. Now, naturally, if you think about institutions and culture, I would like to view them as the lubricant that affects the pace of change. Okay, they're not really the, the, the engine that is affecting the movement itself, but they can affect the pace of change. That's a reinforcing force. Naturally, if you adopt the proper institutions, randomly or otherwise, then the process will be more rapid. If you adopt the wrong institutions or colonialist forces impose on you extractive institutions, naturally, as I mentioned yesterday, this will be the sticks in the wheel of change and will slow the process of development. Now, very importantly, you heard a lot about, uh, about different forces. You heard about deep rooted factors, non deep rooted factors. If you run regression, and you look at the partial R square, deep rooted factors explain 87% of the variations in income per capita today. Okay? That's where we need to search if we want to correct inequality in the world. But now, what about the, the different forces? Culture, institutions, geography, human diversity. 
let me show you what the data is showing. And this is uh, appearing in the handbook chapter in uh, the uh, Mark Q9 uh, released a few months ago. So the dispersal of human agroparticle accounts for 17% in the sort of in the uh, the simplest possible specification. It can go all the way to 25% depending on the specification. So 17% of the unexplained variations in income per capita today are accounted by uh, the dispersal of human agroparticle. This is based on partial R square analysis. The time since human settlement and the Neolithic Revolution clumped together is about 3%. In fact, the Neolithic Revolution is less than 1%. It explains the religion. Geoclimatic factors vary about 27%. The disease environment very important, 16%. Climatic cultural factors are important, 21%. A surprising element for us was the political institutions, given the, I mean, the public relationship of political institutions. In fact, if you look at executive constraints, it accounts for 3%, and some of it, in fact, is accounted by the migration out of Africa, but let's leave it aside. If you take the most expanded possible interpretation, you add the polity for the variable, etc., then it increases to up to 9%. And but for the same specification, human diversity will be 25%. So this gives you some calibration of what we are referring to here, right? Because as I said, many of us will brainwash to think that it's all about institutions. It's certainly not all about institutions, far from. Okay. So the main question that remains, and I'm about to complete my discussion, is whether the grip of the past is long lasting. So it's important to know that the impact of institutions have diminished over time due to the fact that developing countries naturally adopt growth enhancing institutions, perhaps not as fast as uh, uh, one would have hoped to, but they do adopt growth enhancing institutions. The impact of culture has diminished due to the fact that developing countries, citizens of developing countries, emulated growth in entering cultural norms. The adverse effect of geography, a disease environment, landlocked societies, etc., naturally was mitigated by the diffusion of medical technologies, transportation technologies, and IT technologies. Landlocked somewhere, it's not the end of the world any longer, given modern transportation, if you are suffering from a malaria, we just heard that in fact the World Health Organization approved uh, the first uh, vaccine for malaria. But generally speaking, we know that the uh, immunization campaign affected uh, a mortality rate uh, quite significantly in the in some cell. But there is one element okay, where we see little convergence in, in the past uh, past period, which is human diversity. And why is it so? Because, as I mentioned yesterday, individuals tend to be attached to their homelands and native cultures, but in addition, there are great legal barriers to international migration. Now, so this may appear a little disturbing in the sense that are we basically suggesting that there is historical determinism or geographical determinism or an after Africa determinism? And the answer is not at all. And why is it so? Because naturally, proper policy can mitigate this. If you think about the promotion of country-specific education policies geared towards social cohesiveness and tolerance in diverse societies, and geared towards pluralism in homogeneous societies, namely teaching people how to think out of the black box, teaching people how to be future-oriented, teaching people how to cherish uh, diversity, etc., can basically mitigate the cost of diversity on the other hand and enhance the benefits of diversity on the other hand. This will operate towards a reduction in inequality. 
That's very important to understand. In fact, armed with this understanding, we're in a better position to design policies that can mitigate inequality in the world. And think about it in the context of, uh, of development in the field of medicine, and in particular development in the field of cancer treatment. In the past, the general policy was basically an average policy. You had a cancer patient and you prescribed for this cancer patient two treatments, chemotherapy and radiation. Regardless of who this individual is and what is the genetic makeup of this individual. Today, we are basically moving into immunotherapy that allows us basically to target the treatment for each individual. And the lesson from what I presented here is this idea that you can basically ship inclusive institutions into sub-Saharan Africa and this will resolve the problem is incredibly short-sighted. We have to understand the history of each location, we have to understand the diversity in each location, we have to cater policies based on the individual characteristics of each society. So, naturally, the World Bank is advancing the idea of educating societies, that's wonderful. But in fact, there is an additional dimension, which is the nature of the curriculum that should be adopted. In certain societies, the curriculum should be, let's think out of the box, let's challenge the status quo. This is what I would advocate in Bolivia, much more than another years of education. And in the case of, of Ethiopia, let's learn how to appreciate cultural diversity. Let's learn how to appreciate uh, uh, differences across ethnic groups, etc. So again, education can go a long way, but it has to be much more refined, precisely as I explained. And finally, one element in the context of climate change, and I touched upon it in my lecture yesterday. Naturally, reversing the damage that we created will require revolutionary technologies that we cannot envision at the moment. I mean, naturally, something that that is not necessarily uh, on the shelf at the moment. But what is really important is that, um, that mitigating, ultimately reversing the course of climate change, okay, and sustaining the mental smash of, of humanity is really feasible given the, the way that society marched in the present. And with the fact that in the course of the march of humanity, we see first declining fertility, second, human capital formation, and third, an outburst of innovations. These are critical ingredients for the resolution of issues that are associated with climate change. And importantly, the reduction in fertility that we see in less developed society is buying for us this critical time that is needed for scientists to develop these revolutionary technologies that they have in mind, in the sense that we don't need necessarily to reduce the growth rate so as to stabilize uh, uh, carbon emission or even mitigate carbon emission. But, but by doing so, by basically targeting fertility and by permitting growth to be maintained, we can still, by the time that we ultimately permit uh, revolutionary technologies to emerge and climate change uh, to be, uh, to be less catastrophic in terms of the, the population than is predicted to be. Thank you very much.